Hello everyone. I'm Diane Samilas, the curator at Glenara City Council Gallery. I'd like to welcome you all to our first online live in conversation featuring photographer Linda Wachtel and our special guests, Caulfield fashion stylist, Dee Goldberg, and Australian artist, Yvette Comis Coppersmith. Some of the residents who were photographed by Linda for the stories from the interior series. Looking forward to them participating in today's conversation. Ganara City Council respectfully acknowledges the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation who have traditional connections to the land now known as Glenara. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So today we'll be discussing the thought provoking series of photographs of local domestic spaces Stories from the Interior by Linda Wachtel, commissioned by Glenara City Council in 2007, 17. We'll be talking about what home represents to us, particularly at the moment when we're all confined to home during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to ask the audience to please start posting your questions on YouTube and we'll try to respond to some of your questions at the end of this conversation today. So I'd like to commence with some questions for Linda. So Linda, who took the photographs and a couple of questions, Linda, firstly, the photographs, can you talk a bit about how the photographs reflect on everyday life, on decor, the role of place and the interesting narratives that play out in some of these photographs about our domestic environments? Hi, Diane and Hi, everybody, and thanks for asking me to participate in this conversation today. Um, but more importantly, thank you for commissioning me to do the work in the first place, because um, it, was a real priv it was a privilege, actually, to go into the inner sanctums of some of the residents in Glenara. And it's actually a project I'll never forget. It was, it was fabulous. Um, and I think given the current lockdown restrictions, it's unimaginable, of course, that a project like this could even go ahead and would indeed be illegal at the moment. Um, but the notion of home as a sanctuary has never carried more meaning. And I think we can think about that as we have this conversation today, I guess. Um, with this project, I, I see the residents um, representing a microcosm of a typical Australian suburban community. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have any Indigenous volunteers. Um, so it's, it's not a complete picture. But I think since Federation, it tells a story of a country that was built or, or founded through immigration. And I think that the and, the, and the diverse cultural backgrounds and family groups that have originated from across the globe. And in our little group, um, we have Dee, who, for example, came from South Africa. Um, Valtra Reiner, who I, I believe came from Germany, um, the Perts, who are Scottish and so on. Um, then of course, there was just the diversity of age um, and, and occupation. And the youngest subject in the series was the beautiful Ella Rose, who was four years old at the time. And the oldest in the series was Millie, who was 102 and living um, in an aged care home. Um, we had, um, conventional nuclear families represented, single parents raising their young children on their own, widows, widowers, um, people living in shared houses, people living on their own, cross-generational families also living under one roof. So the full gamut, I think, was represented. Um, the photographs, I think, also revealed the diverse lifestyles of the subjects and how we use our homes. And I think four of the subjects were working from home before COVID-19 became part of our collective consciousness. Um, Yvette, who you'll 
who you can see on the screen who'll speak later, um, an accomplished artist who had her studio at the back of her house. Um, Boltrad is um, an extraordinary milliner and her workshop took up most of the upstairs of her house, an amazing workshop, in fact, as I remember it. Um, we have um, the Perts, um, Alan and Alison, who I guess function as contemporary custodians of, of a heritage listed modernist building. So their house actually um, is half home and half living museum. Um, and also I, I, the photographs I think um, gave me, I'd like to think some sort of insight into the, into the unique personalities of the subjects. And, and I was inspired when I saw their homes um, to compose to compose the photographs, I guess, in certain ways. And for example, when I went to Helen Gorey's house, it was very important to her that her meditation practice and, and her yoga um, practice as well was reflected in, in the image. And we took it in her bedroom, which was a calm and restorative sanctuary from the outside world. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we had the eccentric Henry Greener who I took um, with him sitting in his bath, surrounded by his exhaustive, or some of his exhaustive collections of exotic artifacts. And, and in finishing on this point, I would, I would say that I think one thing that every subject had in common, or at least from what I could glean from the short time I was able to spend with them, aside from Millie, who was no longer living in her family home, um, is that the private domestic spaces, which to me came alive with their cherished objects and memories, reflected their personalities, who they are and where they came from. Thanks, Linda. That's a wonderful introduction to the series. And I have to say, when we first displayed the series at Glenara City Council Gallery in 2017, as part of that exhibition, uh, there was such an amazing response from the community. And the series gives you such an insight into the domestic spaces, the diversity of domestic spaces in our community, and also an insight into the personalities and the people who inhabit the spaces and the stories. They, the, the way that they were prepared to share their stories with the wider community. Which brings me to my next question, which is really about the photographs we can see on the screen today. So the fabulous photographs we can see of Dee and Yvette's domestic spaces. Can you talk a bit more about those spaces and just, yeah, just, to, just a bit more about the spaces and what you found when you went, first went into the spaces? Well, um, if I look at, if I compare the two images and the two people, um, to me, it's a tale of two cities, really. Um, I mean, as we know, Yvette is, a, is an accomplished artist and best known to me for her beautiful portraits. Um, and of course, since we did, since we went to her home, she then went on to win the Archibald Prize and and her life has probably shifted in a way that she'll speak to. Um, and I, I sort of found her home to be um, very carefully curated and choreographed, um, elegant and ordered. Um, and, and to me, I think I could see, maybe I was reading too much in it, but to, into it, but to me, I think I could see her skill as a, as a painter and a colorist um, and a technician reflected in the way she decorated her home. Um, and the meaningful objects and artworks and, and books sit, sit together harmoniously. And I can see that as I'm looking um, at this photograph. Um, and I believe there was also, I think, and, and Yvette can correct me later if I'm wrong, that there's a cherished, picture sitting on the table that was painted by her mother. 
In any case, um, I saw Yvette herself um, as the defining object actually of the image and refined and elegant and I situated her that way within the room. Um, and that's how I came to choose that image of, of Yvette. Now, on the other hand, when I got to Dee's house, <laughs> I was greeted, I think, with a cacophony of colour and objects and clothing. Um, and all of them, by the way, which all kind of come together and work very well together. Um, and I just, I walked through there thinking every thought bubble she has ever had has materialised <laughs> on her walls and floors and from her ceilings. And, um, and, and as you can see today, um, Dee makes wearable art and um, each outfit has its own theme. Um, and I think I recall the day that, oh no, it's not Barbie. She was the trolls. It was a troll outfit. That's right. Um, and um, an amazing house full of also all sorts of collections that some of which you can see in this image. Anyway, it was clear to me that the wonderful D should be front and center of this image. And um, I think somehow I'm reminded of a of a picture I saw of Cleopatra long ago. And that's how I see Dee. And that's how those two photographs came to be the way they are. Thanks, Linda. We might now go to Dee and Yvette, chat to them a bit about their domestic spaces. So firstly, Dee, if I could ask you to talk a bit about your unique sense of style and your wearable art, your recycled furniture, in fact, your amazing domestic interior and what home represents for you if you'd like to chat a bit about that well one of the things I always thought that was really important was actually having an outlook from the inside out and I, I'm from Sydney and I had a beautiful outlook there and it was something I was very very reticent to leave but I soon learnt that the internal view is actually much more important and that is how you feel about yourself. And you can really reconstruct things in a, in a home with, from very little because when we first came to live in Melbourne, I picked up a lot of things along the street from dumpsters and I love recycled things and I actually love the juxta to put something in a juxta position and I love things that, that bring humor for example one of the things that i've got since linda's been here is aeroplane seats from ansett seven seven boeing seats and I, and when i first bought them my partner goldie he said what are you doing with aeroplane seats well he uses it now as his office in during the virus time and says how marvelous it is to sit in an aeroplane seat with the with a tray next to him i uh, it must have a story to it. Everything needs to have history. And I'm into more is more and less is a ball. So I am the opposite of a minimalist. But I really can appreciate minimalistic stuff and furnishings as well. But as for me, I'm always needing to add in, to add on to things and nothing is ever finished. Thanks, Dee. Uh, and can you talk a bit more about what home represents to you now, particularly now that we're all living, we're all isolated at home, self-isolating during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I really struggled in the beginning. I was like a badly behaved child and I was <laughs> someone to play with, but no one would play with me. And I remember going down Chapel Street because I worked at Chapel Street Bazaar and I, it was actually the whole aura was unrecognizable it, it, mm. it just felt nothing like chapel street and mm. i came home and thought well i'm going to have to be start emptying this cupboard to see what i can recreate and the good part about being at home is you can make a huge mess in every room and no one is going to just pop in and spring in to see it <laughs> so you can wade through all the stuff 
for days. And that has been something that I have loved is actually just leaving everything out. Because I'm a little bit embarrassed when people come in and every cupboard door is open because I move around the apartment thinking I can find something somewhere else and then I get distracted. So every drawer is open and then everything is cut up on the floor. And so at the end of the day, I just, I can happily sleep on everything. It, 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 <laughs> that has been the best part of being at home. And I and obviously having a sunny home for me has really been amazing. But it's actually to use the space and, um, and not to feel that it's very messy because I am very messy. And that's something that I've loved. The one final thing that Howard and I actually don't believe in getting changed in bedrooms or putting clothes away. So now the whole house is full of shoes, coats, scarves, in the kitchen, there was a my bra was there the other day, but nothing is ever dirty. I am a cleanliness fanatic, but very, very untidy. And how I find a pile of clothes or furnishings, I sometimes get an image and then I make something from it. Thanks, Dee. That's fabulous. Now we might go to Yvette. And Yvette, you described your home as your creative habitat and how it evolves and develops as an artwork. So can you talk a bit about how you activate your space and the energy in your space and perhaps how your home is your sanctuary? Can you talk a bit more about those ideas? Sure. Um, well, I guess for most of my art practice, I have had a studio at home. So it's always been important that when you are in the same space every day, looking at the same um, internal like interior landscape that um, you can sort of reinvigorate your um, ideas and your inspiration by changing the space so my friends would probably laugh if um, you know they told you how many times I, they would visit me and I've rearranged the furniture or I've rehung all my pictures um, redecorated and it's kind of in a way part it's become part of my creative process so particularly after like you, you finish a body of work and then it's like, right, I want to sort of shake it up. And um, yeah, I've been known to sort of get inspired to move couches and sideboards and at like midnight and be like, right, I have to do this now. And I'm not waiting for any, any help. And I just kind of have this incredible um, burst of strength to, to move furniture by myself. But it feels like it's the initial shift that then opens up new energy and also new ways of thinking and I start to look at um, I guess what do I want in my own home what what are the things aesthetically that I want to bring into my space and maybe that's probably that's sort of become um, the way that I work out my ideas and what I want to make next by making myself the client in a sense it doesn't happen every time because you do make work for other contexts. Um, but I think as a kid, when I had my own bedroom at home and I drew faces from my imagination and every so often, like I, I, they were stuck up on my wardrobe and the door. And I remember every so often I'd get bored of them and I'd take them all off and rearrange and rehang just with blue tack, put my drawings back up. And in a way like that has continued, but it's now that you can do it in your whole uh, space. But I think, um, I think it's really important when you're um, going through a process of change within yourself to reflect that in your external, like around you. We're sort of in, um, we've created like an aquarium around us of objects that we live in. And sometimes that just doesn't feel like it's really feeding you or nourishing you or reflecting who you, who you are now or how you want to think about yourself. So I think uh, it was either Linda or Dee mentioned like, you know, the most important thing is how you feel about yourself within. And so I think from there you want to then influence um, what you make, but it's also there's that uh, cycle where the things around you also influence how you feel. So um, it's about sort of shifting those things in order to 
reimagine maybe your concept of self and your ideas, your aesthetic as it's changing and what, what you need now and then what you need from your artwork to, to kind of feed you, especially what I feel is interesting uh, now in this period of people are finding they're really sort of thrown back in on themselves and they haven't got those other energies of people that shift how they feel about themselves. And it's like most people are generally operating on a personality level. And when you don't get to perform that personality, you can feel like, who am I without that in, um, persona, without that character that we've kind of crafted? And I feel like I, that that's something I um, really learned about, like how to let go of what that is, but then how to then inhabit a persona and how to create that. And I've, I've looked at teaching as a way to um, have another role for me to inhabit that I don't have in the studio. But I also am aware of how we create our personalities, you know, through fashion, through so many forms of personal expression that kind of craft these things, which when we're at home, I mean, maybe Dee doesn't feel this, but I think there's this sense that you lose that. You don't need to put the mask on and you can lose that um, need to have something for the outer world to have a self-expression. So then who are we when we're just within? And I think what I find is that, well, you have a lot of thoughts and they are do, they go on repetition and you have to learn how to manage that. You have to learn how to manage your emotional ups and downs by yourself. Um, so it's learning those kind of basic tools and also um, really you start to feel like your own aliveness and it gets really concentrated because you are inside a, a container, which is the home. And I think allowing yourself to feel really concentrated in your own energy of who you are and what is trying to sort of be expressed is where artists make work from and mm. poets and painters, that's the kind of germinating energy for creativity. So while everybody is trying to stay connected online and look at culture and stay connected with ideas and art and movies and Instagram, for me, I think that's like, we've got, as an artist, it's really important to keep that in a box so it doesn't overwhelm that um, space for imagination and creativity. Thanks, Yvette. And I might just go back to um, Dee, just to, Dee, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned missing the community, as that sense of community. Can you talk today a little bit about that? When I talk about the community, it's not actually my close friends, because they I've kept in touch with by phone. It is the community of my op shops. It's the community of people who, who I know from the street in Paran. It's to chatting to them all the time. It's the coffee guy. It is where I go, especially with op shops. And it's something that I've really missed, which I haven't been able to do is I, I dance. And I'm, I'm the community of dancing where I am is just opposite where the housing commission is. And all those different characters who know me and they chat and a lot of the old people. I've, I've got an absolute pension, like passion for old people. And I've really, really missed that. I, I didn't think about the community. I always thought the community was actually my friends, but it's, it's a wider community. And I really miss the, um, the chatting. In fact, I had a really big confession to make. I had to go to, to a doctor's appointment and it was supposed to be 40 minutes there and back. And two hours later, I came home and Goldie said to me, where have you been? I said, to Surrey Hills. He said, no, that didn't take two hours. I then, I didn't do anything illegal, but I drove all around the area of Whitehorse Road and Kew and uh, Mount Albert. And I photographed all the, uh, the closed secondhand shops so that I know what's happening when they all open up. So that is the kind of thing that gives me complete joy. I have, actually think I have very simple needs, tragically. <laughs> I have very, very simple needs. And if something is colourful and joyful and engaging, it just lights my fire, my internal fire. Thanks, Dee. And Linda, did you have any questions you'd like to ask 
be an event today during our live conversation? Well, I, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, the And it's a, a, apropos of the photographs I, I took of both of you. Um, how... How actually, how did each of you feel about them? And do you think that they represented, they were a fair represent, representation of how you see yourself or at least part of yourself? It might be your professional self or your private self, but I am interested in, in your response to the images. Um, Yvette, you might like to answer first. <laughs> It's like a time capsule of, you know, that particular moment and everything might have changed and been rearranged the day after or the day before. And that outfit I wore once in 2017 and it was for the day of the shoot. And it turns out people think I look like Snow White with that particular colour combination. But so I feel like it's, and I think it's something that I feel in my own work, like a little uncomfortable of people thinking one image is definitive of who I am. Because I don't really identify with any one image and that's why I keep making more. I just feel like I'm, I make images and I just, you know, if I use anybody, sometimes it's myself because that's, you know, as good as anyone else. And also I'm available in the studio. So uh, yeah, it's just kind of funny that it's like, well, the, at that particular moment, that's how I was arranged and that's how I had my hair and, and outfit. And I don't know exactly why I made those no, I know. I wanted to have colour in the photograph, so that's why I put that on. But, um, yeah, it's such a, it's so changeable and it's so determined by mood and thoughts and situations. So you can look at a photo. It's like looking back at in, and going, oh, yeah, I think that's what was going on in my life at the time. Yeah. Yeah. D? Hey. This is an interesting one because when you asked me to do this, Linda, I was very reticent because I hadn't been feeling well and I didn't realize that I'd had Parkinson's, undiagnosed Parkinson's and was feeling really, really awful. So I didn't really want to do the shoot because I was worried about the way I was feeling. So when I look at that photo and I... It definitely represents me. And I, I actually came home from somewhere. I might have gone to Coles like that. It's, that's also possible. Hmm. And I had another <laughs> in mind. You said to me, no, just wear that outfit. So, But when I look at the, the photo today, I am just so happy and thrilled that I can still sit on my couch and still can go out to markets and still do things and dance. And I'm still doing things that are, and making things like that. That is probably the most important thing. And, you know, I know I look at that photo and I go, oh, my God, it was like I look much younger. I don't think like that anymore. I'm thinking I'm still standing up. I'm still creative. So for me, it's actually bringing into line my life with Parkinson's that can still continue. But it is at a different speed. And I don't want to make out like my Parkinson's is nothing. It has been a real, I cannot do and run around like I used to. So I have to plan more. And that's the frustrating thing for me. I can't just get in the car and go to Thornbury or go to Coburg Markets. Mm -hmm. I have to think about it. But the essence is I can still do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both, uh, Dee and Yvette. Just a quick question for me. So um, in the next you know, three to six months, do you have any ideas about perhaps transforming your own domestic spaces? Any ideas around perhaps you know, adding some bits and pieces, perhaps some personal collecting that might be going on behind the scenes during the pandemic and how you might think about transforming your domestic spaces in the future? Yes, I have started to move out into my garden and our garden is open. It's anybody can come in and I have made it a community garden and it has given me incredible joy. We're not talking about flowers. In the garden, there is kites in the trees. There are mobiles. There is secondhand toys. There is beautiful toys from the 60s. There's a pedal car. There's painted drums and all sorts of toys. And 
I have actually created a space for the children in the neighborhood. And the wonderful thing is people often say to me, don't they pinch your things? Because there must be about 200 things outside. No one has ever taken anything because I bless it. And if they need to take something, they need it more than what I do. So that is, it's, the garden has just been a thrilling time for me during the virus because we've actually had very good weather. And I've been placing all my stories and, I, and, and, and it's just been absolutely marvelous. Just before, the, the day before lockdown, I was going to my exercise class and I saw these two lions in the, up in, in the Vinnie's window and I thought, oh, I'll just get, get it on the way back. I came back and some man was standing next to my bloody lions that I wanted to buy. I stood there and willed him to walk away. I picked them up, went up to the counter and the lady said to me, she's gonna give it to me for half price because I'm such a good client there. And now I've got these two lions in the front of our block of flats and I'm a Leo. And that, that is the kind of thing I had incredible joy doing. Thanks Dee, thanks for sharing that fabulous story. And Yvette, do you, would you like to share something about your domestic space and plan and my plans yeah and your plans for the for I the guess next um months. yeah I think really for me now is um the 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 artworks will probably change around because I'll be I, the next few months I'll be making new work so I use the lounge, like I, look, I just use my living space to put work to kind of test out if it, if I'm happy with it. Um, and it's almost like I need to take it out of the room that's the studio and put it in my living space to be able to see, uh, does it work as a picture? Am I happy with it? And changing that context. So I think there'll be a lot more of that in the next few months and using my space to um, really think about what I, what I want to make. But I also have a room of things that's just there's some boxes stored of things I need to sort out, which is like old e-waste. Um, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, like at the moment, it's like I can sort it out and work out where it's going to go, but you can't really take it anywhere. Um, the places that probably shut. So it'll be maybe just putting things in place for when the opportunity happens and when I can take things to the op shop again. Thanks, Yvette. And now, look, we're going to, um, we've got some fabulous questions from our audience today. So the first question is directed at Linda. So Linda, how did you choose the spaces that you photographed in each of the different homes? Um, well, I once I, when, once I went to the homes and I had the opportunity to speak to the subjects for a while, uh, um, I think that the, the spaces became obvious, the rooms became obvious. Um, for example, um, and we don't have an image of it up on the screen, but we, I went and photographed a lovely man called S Stephen Schmedig, who lives in a, in a house that actually his family has lived in for, I think, through five generations um, and, I think has been witness to all the major life cycle events in his family. And Stephen bakes, um, I wouldn't say every day, but he is a, he is a prolific baker of, of cakes and pastries, um, which he began um, making when his wife was ill and in long-term palliative care. And he would bake cakes to take into the nursing staff um, to thank them for looking after his wife. And he's continued this ritual, um, I'm sure mostly to honor his wife, but I'm sure he also enjoys doing it. Um, so it just became very obvious that we should take the photograph of him in his kitchen. And in fact, it was the only image where I, I brought in an object from another room, which I normally would never do. But um, as we were walking around the house, Stephen pointed out his favorite photograph that he has taken with his wife. And I felt I wanted to bring her into that room, not for him, but actually for me to focus on. 
and that hopefully it becomes um, a lovely memento for his grandchildren and, and great grandchildren in years to come. So the kitchen for him was a very obvious um, place and, and all, the other, all the other subjects and in fact, the rooms spoke to me about them and that's how I made those decisions. Thanks, Linda. Now, another question for you is, which was your favourite home to photograph as part of the stories from the interior series? Tricky well, question. You know, <laughs> it's like having a favourite child and I don't, I don't have one, to be honest. And in fact, looking back over the series, I think each image has really its own integrity. Um, so I, I honestly don't have a favourite image. For me, it was just such a fabulous opportunity to meet all these different people. And that's what I took away with me. I mean, I do have a, a very particular interest in architecture. So having the opportunity to go in and photograph the Ernest Fuchs house was a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, but really, I, I don't have a favourite. And each house contained their own unique and amazing stories and histories. Thanks, Linda. So Dee, the next question's for you. So what are your one or two favorite pieces of wearable art that you've made? I think my favorite piece is a Marilyn Monroe one that I made and it's ongoing. Hmm. I found pieces of fabric and recently I found, just, just before lockdown, I found a whole lot of stamps it was were together a collector's item with Marilyn Monroe's face on that I'm actually looking at making a necklace and I absolutely love Marilyn Monroe and that I think is one of my favorites I'm also crazy about music so I've got a David Bowie outfit I've got a Kiss outfit I've got the Beatles outfit I've got but then I make a winter one a summer one and because we live in Melbourne one with three quarter sleeves so I continue making things. And at the moment, I'm really enjoying flamingos. That is something because I just love the color. And I saw a picture the other day in India of a whole lot of flamingos because I think they come out at this time. And pink is my favorite color. But it's an ongoing process. Thanks, Dee. And we've got another question from Mary for Linda. So Linda, what do you think drives you to express yourself artistically? I, ah, yes, okay. I thought I was on mute there, which wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, I, that's a, that's a very, intimate question actually I think what drives me is um and and actually to go back to Dee and Yvette you know we all have an inner life and we're the sum of all those memories and experiences and I think I will always be driven to express every, anything I'm feeling through my creative process and I think that's my inspiration, really. Thanks, Linda. Uh, now, I think we might, unless we have a few more, any more questions from the audience, we might wrap up today's event. Um, but before we conclude, I just wanted to thank Linda D and Yvette for their participation today. Uh, thank you all. It's been a fabulous uh, conversation about home and what home represents. And I'd also like to thank the people behind the scenes who made this event possible. Special thanks to our fabulous technician, Leo Damiani, the Council's Innovation and Continuous Improvement Team, and our very own Arts and Culture Team. So Tori and the team, thank you so much. This online in conversation today can be viewed next week on the Arts and Culture Facebook page and shared with friends. Mm -hmm. And family.
we'd love you to the on you today's conversation ends. Uh, this series of online conversations are scheduled each Sunday afternoon, sorry, each month. So at 3 p.m. on the first Sunday of the month. So next, we're delighted to announce that photographer Ponch Hawks and some of our local gardeners who were photographed as part of the uh, Poetry of the Earth series back in 2016. They, they will be featured on Sunday, the 7th of June at 3 p.m. So we look for, forward to joining Ponch and some of the gardeners then. Thank you, Linda D and Yvette for your participation today. It's been fabulous chatting with you all and thank you all for listening and we look forward to chatting to you in a month. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.